All right, let me invite you to grab a Bible. <clears throat> we are continuing our study of the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 11. And uh, this morning we're going to be studying verses 19 through 30. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. And as you turn into the Word and find your place, <clears throat> I want to pause and pray and ask for the Lord's help. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for the Scriptures. They're fully inspired by You, Your very breath. Lord, we pray that You would help us, enable us to hide them in our hearts, that we might not sin against You, Lord. May Your Word be a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. Lord, we pray that You would move at this time and instruct us, Lord. I pray that Your Spirit would give us understanding and illumination in this text before us, Lord. I pray for conviction and conversion and edification for the saints, Lord, that you would be at work ultimately bringing glory to your name. During this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. This is what Paul writes. No, Luke. Luke writes this. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he had come and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's Word. That meeting we read about in Galatians chapter 2 was here at the end of our passage as Barnabas and Saul brought the offering to the church in Jerusalem. At least that's what we believe was the case. So, we, we've been studying the book of Acts for some time now. Uh, I'm not sure how long, but it's been some time. Um, I'm sure you're probably missing judges. Um, but <laughs> One of the cool things about studying the book of Acts is tracking the progress of the gospel and the expansion of the church. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, and when the Spirit comes, you're going to be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth. That's the outline of the book of Acts. And which part of the outline are we in right now? We're in Antioch. Where's that? Is that Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria? No, that's ends of the earth, right? And we're still, we're, we're in paradise this morning, right? That's ends of the earth comparatively. A and so... He told them this was going to be the case. And so far, we've been seeing up until this point, where was home base? It was the church in Jerusalem, right? That was the, the epicenter for the church. It was the foundation point. It was the home base. That's where the apostles were posted up. And it's where the mission was being conducted. But what's happening now in the book of Acts is we're seeing a shift from Jerusalem being the hub of Christian ministry to Antioch, becoming that kind of launching point for mission in the church. And so 
we see what's happening here. How did this church begin? Does anybody know how our church started? I was hoping you'd tell me. Uh, I wasn't here for it. I know some of the details, of course. But, but it's interesting when you see the birth of a church and how it then proceeds to grow. And then sadly, sometimes you see deaths of churches, which should not surprise us. Jesus warned us about that in Revelation, right? Where lampstands are being taken away. But here we get a front row seat to see the birth and expansion of this church in Antioch, this church that the Lord used mightily. And I, and I think I could speak for all of you here that we would have a desire for our church to be, mu- be used mightily of the Lord like Antioch, right? To spread the gospel, to make disciples, ultimately to bring glory to God's name. That's why we exist, right? And so this text fits well with what we've been studying out about in Sunday school, about our purpose as a church, why we exist to make disciples, to bring glory to God. And here we see a glimpse of how this mission of the church is being spread. And so in our text this morning, we see the church's mission spreading through believers that are Christ-centered. We see the church's mission spreading through believers being Christ-centered. And we're going to study four ways that the believers in Antioch were completely identified with Jesus Christ. Four ways they were completely identified with Jesus Christ. The first way is they were preaching the Lord Jesus. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. So Luke just finished the saga, the account of Peter going to Cornelius, the Gentile, and his house and sharing the gospel and seeing the Holy Spirit come on on Cornelius and his family and friends and saving these Gentiles who did not have to get circumcised first, who did not have to obey the religious and moral ceremonial, not the moral, but the the ceremonial law. And so we saw Peter got on board with the Lord and the church in Jerusalem was a little bit slower, but they got on board with the work of the Lord as well. And now Luke starts this new section And he starts by reminding us about something from chapter 8. Look at verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. We cannot overestimate how wide-ranging of effect Stephen's death had on the spreading of the gospel. Right? Do you remember... Back in chapter 8, studying about Stephen, studying about his death, ultimately, he was so gifted. Wasn't he? He It's similarly described to uh, Barnabas here, who's full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. He was a dynamic defender of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a very gifted individual, and it would be very tempting for us to say, God, why would you do this? Why would you let this guy get killed? We need him. We need him serving you. Why would you let this man die and be martyred? We could have accomplished so much for the cause of Jesus Christ. But what does God do? We have Stephen being killed, and his death and the persecution that came from his death caused more good than he could have ever done in his entire life for the cause of Christ. I don't know Stephen, but I'm willing to guess that he would be overjoyed to know how the gospel spread because of his death. If if all of us could die so fruitfully. And so here's Stephen. What what happened as a result of his death? A great persecution broke out against Christians in Jerusalem. And Stephen's death led then to Christians scattering into Judea and Samaria and people getting saved in Judea and Samaria. Stephen's death led to the salvation of the Ethiopian eunuch. Stephen's death led to the conversion of Saul, who we know better as the Apostle Paul. And Luke tells us here that it was Stephen's death which caused believers to scatter as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Now, we'd be tempted to say, well, are these believers not trusting in the Lord that they're running away? Isn't this a lack of faith that they're running and they're not staying planted and spreading the gospel and not being afraid? Are they filled with fear? No, they're wise, right? And so they are running, they are scattering, but as they scattered, what did they do? They preached the gospel. 
It would be a different story if they scattered and kept their mouths shut. They scattered and they preached the gospel. So it came to Phoenicia. Phoenicia is modern, present-day Lebanon, along the Mediterranean coast, north of Israel. Its main cities were Tyre and Sidon. Cyprus was an island in northwest Mediterranean Sea. Does anybody remember? Here's, here's bonus points. Who's from Cyprus? Does anybody remember? Barnabas. Barnabas is from Cyprus. And so that was an island out in the Mediterranean Sea. But we're also told it spread to Antioch. What do you know about Antioch in the ancient world? Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, only behind Rome and Alexandria. It's estimated that at this time, Antioch would have had 500,000 residents, so half a million people living in Antioch. Uh, Antioch was a cosmopolitan city. It was a melting pot. It consisted of large numbers of Jews and Arabs and Greeks all living together. It was a commercial center. It was right on the Orontes River. And so it was able to trade and it was very wealthy. And as you might also guess, Antioch was known for its immorality. And so it had a very well-known outdoor brothel that people frequently visited. It had a reputation for debauchery. A Roman senator was trying to describe how Rome, which had been morally upright in the days of the Republic, had become corrupted by the moral degeneracy of the East. And so this is what he poetically said. He said, the Orontes has flowed into the Tiber. Basically, in other words, the corruption of Antioch has spread into Rome. Now, when you think about it, And think about the corruption and the immorality happening in Antioch. That should make us all realize that makes it a prime location for a church. Right? That's where a church needs to be. In the midst of that great need. This is exactly where the gospel needs to spread. We as believers are not called to run away from the world. We are called to be in the world, not of the world but to be salt and to be light in the middle of the world. And so they, Antioch desperately needed Jesus. Just like we desperately need Jesus here, right? So the gospel spread to Antioch, but notice the initial missionary activity that's happening. As the believers scattered, they're sharing the gospel, but who are they sharing it with only at first? Only the Jews, okay? Now we saw how all that started to change with Peter, right? And Cornelius, we saw that. on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm fascinated about this because I don't know the time frame. Part of me wonders, did they hear that Peter said it was okay and they started doing it, or did they just start doing it, right? Start spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. We're, we're not told exactly. But here they are. There are some men who came from Cyprus and from Cyrene. They started sharing the gospel with the Hellenists. Now, who are the Hellenists? Have you met a Hellenist? Who are they? Uh, Hellenists, earlier in Acts, we saw the Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews, right? Stephen was a Hellenist, and Saul would be a Hellenist, and Barnabas was a Hellenist. But clearly, Luke is not talking about Greek-speaking Jews here because that would not be a big deal. That was They're already getting the gospel, right? Greek-speaking Jews already heard the truth about Jesus. No, in the context, who is Luke contrasting with the Hellenists in verse 19? They're contrasted with? The Jews, okay? And so the word here simply means people who observe the Greek language and culture. James Montgomery Boyce says that these Hellenists are those what we would call today as pagans. Pagans. Because Antioch was a very pagan city. And so notice the progression we've studied so far in the book of Acts. The gospel goes to the Jews first, then to the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, then to the Samaritans, And then we saw with Cornelius, it was a God-fearing Gentile. It's almost as if the Lord knows how slowly we need things to progress, right? God-fearing Gentiles, those are Gentiles who who worship the God of Israel. They weren't full proselytes, but they worship the God of Israel. But now, finally, now the gospel is going to the pagans, right? To those who had no idea who Yahweh is. And so what is the name of these evangelists who are spreading the gospel in Antioch? What's her name? 
We're not told, right? They're anonymous. And here are these anonymous people sharing the good news of Jesus. And notice Luke's wording here. What message did they preach? They preached the person. They preached the Lord Jesus. Literally, the text says they preached the good news of Jesus Christ. So I, I don't know about you, but one of the benefits I have received from studying and preaching through the book of Acts is the clarification for the church's message. We've seen it over and over again. There is a message that we've been given to fixate on. There's a message that we've been given to proclaim. There is a message that we've been given that to be pouring out of us. And it is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we see over and over again. God sets up a divine meeting between Cornelius and Peter. Why? So that Peter could tell Cornelius what he was thinking about? No, so that he could share the gospel of Jesus Christ. God set up a meeting between Philip and an Ethiopian eunuch who just happened to be reading Isaiah 53. Why? So that Philip can tell him about the good news of Jesus Christ. And this all reinforces the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ must be the core message of our church. It must be the core message of every true and faithful church. And so every sermon coming from this pulpit and from any other Christian pulpit must have Jesus as its main content. And I don't care if we're preaching in Judges or Ruth or Acts. It's all about Jesus Christ. And that does not mean every sermon is a simplistic rehearsing of the gospel presentation. Where no matter what we preach about, at the very end I say, and if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, you need to do that, right? We, but Pastor, you didn't mention Jesus not once in the sermon, right? That's not, that's not good enough. That's not what I'm saying here. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the sun which every other message of the church orbits around, okay? That message must hold forth. It holds every other message of the church together. It's the gospel of Jesus which gives light to every other message. It gives warmth to every other message. It gives life to every other message. And so we want to preach the full counsel of God's word. But in order to do that, we need to understand how every single part of God's word points us back to the truth of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Charles Spurgeon said it best, so I'm just going to quote him. He said, the motto of all true servants of God must be, we preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon without Christ in it is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. No Christ in your sermon, sir? Then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. Amen. In a different sermon, Spurgeon says this, leave Christ out? Oh, my brethren, better leave the pulpit out altogether. If a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. Certainly the last of any Christian ought to go hear him preach. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the lifeblood of the church. It's the message we must continually center on and feed upon. That's what established the church in Antioch. It didn't get established by preaching health and wealth. It got established by preaching Christ, a person who has died on the cross, who rose from the grave. It's that message of Jesus which served to completely help the the Antiochians completely identify themselves with Christ. So this takes us to a second way believers in Antioch were completely identified with Jesus. And that is they were believing in the Lord Jesus. They were believing in the Lord Jesus. So preaching is vital. But it's not going to help people if they're not going to believe it. So look at verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was on them. A great number who believed turned to the Lord. So, have you ever had the hand of the Lord on you? What does that feel like? What do you think? To say that the hand of the Lord was upon the church. That's another way of talking about his power. That's another way of talking about his blessing. So, God's power and his blessing was on these evangelists and as a result of the lord's hand being on these evangelists and on this work we're having lots of people turn in faith to christ what's happening people are getting saved that's what's happening and this is a great reminder to us that revival is not the result of a human formula 
You understand that? We can't plan revivals. We pray for revivals. You can't plan that it's going to take place. Many people turning and trusting in the Lord is not the result of human wisdom, human eloquence, or human ability. It's the result of the hand of the Lord being upon you. That's what's happening, right? If people are going to get saved, if revival is going to break out in the Lord, bring it. Like we, we want that, right? If that's going to happen, it can only happen if the hand of the Lord is on the work. Now, people are important. People are absolutely necessary, right? We, we, we see this being repeated over and over again in the book of Acts. God does not send his angels to go preach the gospel. You see it? He doesn't say, hey, Gabriel, uh, Antioch needs to hear the truth of the gospel. You better go tell him. Right? He, do, he doesn't send his angels to preach the gospel. He doesn't just implant the good news in people's brains when they're walking down the road. He uses believers to preach and teach the gospel. That's why he sends Philip to the, Antio- the, the Ethiopian eunuch. That's why he sends Peter to Cornelius' house. Because true revival can only happen when the hand of the Lord is on his people pro- proclaiming the truth of the gospel. Salvation is God's work. So if you're saved here this morning, I know two things happened to you. At least two, okay? First, somebody told you about Jesus. I don't know who. Somebody told you about Jesus. Secondly, I know the second thing that happened to you, God's hand came upon you. Salvation doesn't happen apart from God. It doesn't happen apart from His work. His Spirit has to open your blind eyes to the truth. His Spirit has to change your heart to see the truth about Jesus. And So somebody told you about Jesus, and God helped you to understand the truth about Jesus. And if you're saved here today, it's because those two things happened to you. And so look at verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Seems like the church in Jerusalem always had its ear to the ground, didn't it? Have you noticed that? They caught word about the Samaritans believing the word of God, the gospel. So they sent Peter and John to check it out, right? Then the church in Jerusalem heard that Peter was eating with Gentiles. They heard, right? And so they called Peter in and made him give an account for what he was doing. Here again, the church of Jerusalem hears about how these Gentiles, these pagans up in Antioch are getting saved. They're getting saved through the preaching of the gospel. And it's not a bad thing. It was the job of the church of Jerusalem and the apostles to check, to validate the message was being received faithfully and accurately. And so here, that's what's taking place. They were entrusted with the message of Jesus. And what's really interesting here, the church sends somebody to check it out. And what's interesting is they don't check, they don't send a disciple. They don't send one of the apostles. They're not sending Peter or James or John, right? They're they're not even sending uh, Thomas or Nathaniel or the good Judas, right? They're not sending any of those guys. Who do they send? Barnabas. They send Barnabas. Not one of the twelve. Yet we know he was a faithful believer. We know he was a generous believer. Remember earlier in Acts, he sold his land and gave the proceeds to the apostles. You remember that? He was a guy also that stood up for Saul when nobody wanted to trust that Saul was really saved. Here Barnabas steps up and says he's a true believer, right? And so here Barnabas is the hand-picked guy that is sent to Antioch to check on the work. And what did Barnabas find when he got there? Look at verse 23. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them, to, uh, exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So Barnabas gets to Antioch, and what does he see? He sees the grace of God. Have you seen the grace of God? If I would ask you, what does the grace of God look like? How, how would you answer that question? Barnabas saw the grace of God in Antioch. What does that look like? Have you seen the grace of God in this church? What does that mean? You know what the grace of God looks like? It looks like sinners turning from their sins and trusting in Jesus Christ. It it looks like sinners finding forgiveness through the sacrifice 
of Jesus and receiving eternal life. It looks like selfless love for one another that's being driven by the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. It looks like sinners forgiving other sinners because they have been forgiven so much by the Lord Jesus. That's what the grace of God looks like. It looks like the Holy Spirit changing hearts and giving new desires, changing lives. And Barnabas saw it and it made him glad because he knew that the gospel message was faithfully received by this church. He didn't need to supplement their understanding. Sometimes that happened early on, right? Where, where the, God, the message is spread. I think of Apollos. Apollos didn't understand it fully, right? And so his, his knowledge needed to be supplemented. That's not the case here. Barnabas saw that people were truly saved. So what does he do? What do you think Barnabas would do? Who remembers what Barnabas' name means? Son of encouragement, right? So what does he do? He encourages, Right? He encourages, he exhorts them to stay faithful in the Lord and keep going. Now, I'll I'll remind you, Barnabas' parents did not name him Barnabas. They named him Joseph. Who named him Barnabas? Son of encouragement. That was the apostles who gave him that nickname, right? And so the son of encouragement is encouraging the church in Antioch to persevere in the faith and to foster a wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ. And Luke reminds us what kind of man he was in verse 24. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Luke's description of Barnabas reminds you of who? A good man, full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Stephen. That's how Stephen is described. And again, Luke tells us many people are added to the Lord. Isn't that an interesting way to describe church growth? People were added to the Lord. So far in Acts, we have seen Luke say that the Lord added to their number or that the Lord added to the church. Here, essentially, Luke says the Lord added to the Lord. You see that? The Lord added to the Lord. John Stott gives a helpful summation of this. He says, when we see the Lord adding to the Lord so that he is both the subject and object, source and goal of evangelism, we have to repent of all self-centered, self-confident concepts of Christian mission. You have to hear and understand that Christian mission happens by the hand of the Lord. He uses us. We're important. right? Like I said, he's not sending angels to preach. He's sending us But all you can do is plant seeds and you can water seeds. But God's got to grow those seeds because we can't do that. And so the Lord adds. He'll use our faithful witness, but the Lord adds to his number. He's the one who makes it happen. And so you notice, how does all this take place? How do people get added to the number of the Lord? How do people get added to the church? Is there an obstacle course you have to complete? If you complete the obstacle course, you're in. Is that what it is? You have to be so righteous. And so God says, you know what? If you obey my law, 60% hit rate. If you're about 60% good at obeying the law, you can get in. Is that what happens? How are the people added to the Lord? It's by faith. That's it. It's faith and trust in Jesus and what Jesus has done for them. And we see in verse 21, God is at work in the hearts of a large number of Gentiles in Antioch who are believing in Jesus. They're trusting. They're believing. And Barnabas sees their faith. And what does he do? He encourages them. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep persevering in the Lord. We need to hit that reminder too. You must keep going. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Persevere in the faith. So the believers in Antioch are completely identified with Jesus through their faith in Him. The third mark of their identity in Jesus is their learning in the Lord Jesus. Their learning in the Lord Jesus. There's a lot of admirable traits that Barnabas has. Here's more. Barnabas is looking around at Antioch, the work happening here. He's looking at the church. He's like, there's a lot of people getting saved. 
<laughs> There's a lot of people coming to trust in the Lord. This is a great work, but I can't do this on my own. Right? That's what he said. He sees. I have all these Gentiles probably did had very little biblical foundation, very little understanding of the scriptures. And so he says, I I need help ultimately. So what does he do? He takes a road trip to Tarsus. Okay, look at verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. To look for Saul. So you remember how Saul ended up in Tarsus? Well, that's where he grew up. Okay, he's from Tarsus. But if you remember that Saul, after Stephen's death, was persecuting the church, dragging men and women off to be thrown in prison, hoping they would be killed. And Saul then went to Damascus with letters from the high priest in order to arrest more Christians in Damascus. And then what happened on his way to Damascus? The hand of the Lord came upon him, (laughs) right? The hand of the Lord. Jesus blinded him. Jesus grabbed a hold of him, right? And so Saul was converted. And as he was in Damascus, he spent some time in Arabia for three years. He went back to Damascus and was preaching the gospel, and people did not like it. They could not refute him. They could not confound him. And so soon, people wanted to kill him in Damascus. And what happened? His friends, fellow Christians, they put him in a basket. They lowered him over the city wall to, so that he might be escaped. And so from there, he went to Jerusalem and as he got to Jerusalem, the church is like, yeah, we heard about you. Stay away, right? We don't, we don't it sounds nice, all right? You're one of us now. That sounds nice. I don't, I don't think so. Even though the apostles are holding him at arm's length, and who was it that said, no, 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 he's legit. He's the real deal. He's a believer. Who was it? It was Barnabas, son of encouragement. Barnabas says he's truly seen the Lord and he's preaching the gospel. And so the apostles, Peter and James at least, embraced Barnabas, or or excuse me, Saul, and Saul started preaching the gospel in Jerusalem until he got people angry that wanted to kill him again. It's a pattern in his life, unfortunately. He would go, he would preach, people want to kill him. Okay? And so the disciples, the Christians, are like, all right, this guy's going to get killed. We need to we need to send him somewhere safe. So they sent him to Tarsus, where he was from. And so we're probably about seven or eight years later here. We don't know exactly what he's doing. I'm sure he's preaching the gospel in Tarsus. But now Barnabas is looking around at all these these people who are trusting in the Lord, who need teaching, who need to be strengthened. And and he's thinking, "I, I know a gifted guy who can help. And so Barnabas went the 130 miles from Antioch to Tarsus. It's about seven or eight days to get there. And then we look at verse 26. Luke tells us that when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And you don't get the idea that he needed much convincing. Right? Saul seems to be ready to go. And what Barnabas does here is really important because he recognizes a need and he recognizes somebody's giftedness. And then he taps him on the shoulder saying, hey, sir, and we can use Barnabases in church today like that, who can see a need, see somebody's giftedness, and say, hey, why don't you try serving in this area? And so we see that example. Look at the rest of verse 26. <clears throat> when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So, how long are Saul and Barnabas there? One year, right? And what did they spend all their time doing for that one year? That Luke tells us, at least. They taught. They taught, right? They're teaching the church in Antioch. In a lot of ways, this picture of the church in Antioch is reminiscent of the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, right? Who were devoted to the apostles' teaching, uh, devoted to each other, to caring for each other, to giving generously to each other. And so we see something similar brewing here in Antioch. They They devoted themselves to learning. And they had one of the most gifted teachers in the history of the church, the apostle Paul, who was well qualified to give a Christian 101 course, right? That's happening in Antioch. What did they teach? What does Luke say? What did they teach? We're not told exactly what Barnabas and Saul taught, but 
I'm fairly confident the main subject was Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, I'm sure they went through the Old Testament showing all the prophecies and the types and the institutions and how they're all pointing to Jesus and talking about his life and his death and his resurrection and how it's prophesied in the scriptures. But how do we know Jesus is the focal point of all their teaching for that year? How do you know they were Christ centered? How do you know they were fixated with Jesus? Look at the end of verse 26. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called what? Christians. You don't pick the name Christian to call somebody because they spent all their time talking about geometry. You call them Christians because all they talked about was this Christ. That's what they were fixated on. Now, most commentators think that this was a derogatory term given to them by unbelievers saying, oh, it's those Christians. All the, the, the Christ this and Christ that. That's all they talk about is that guy, right? That's all they talk about. Because the name Christian means belonging to Christ or a follower of Christ. And you notice that name shows us they're being separated from the Jews as distinct in this city. They were, this, they're not saying, oh, those, that's just the Jews. This was a distinct group. And so they earned their reputation because of their specific focus on Jesus. And we know this name probably came from Gentiles because the word Christ is the Greek version of the Hebrew Messiah or anointed one. And so they probably thought maybe Christ was his last name like many people think today, right? Oh, they were talking about that Jesus Christ guy. In reality, it's not a, they, didn't, they didn't understand it was a proper title. Up until now, what did the Christians call themselves? Up until now, they were believers. They called themselves disciples. Uh, they called themselves members of the way. Right? But it's in Antioch where the people first, other people started calling them Christians because they were followers of Jesus and servants of Jesus. And a nickname like that lets us know all we need to know what their fixation and obsession was. I think it's a helpful thing to ask ourselves what do we fixate on as a church? And if somebody would start giving us a nickname by the thing that we're so centered on, what would it be? I would be delighted if our reputation was, oh, it says those Jesus people talking about the gospel all the time, right? And so we see the complete identity of the believers in Antioch with their learning and their nickname. Fourthly, we see they're completely identified with Jesus in their giving to the Lord Jesus, in their giving to the Lord Jesus. So a prophet comes from Jerusalem. Look at verses 28, 27 and 28. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Now you know that from the time of Malachi to the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, there was 400 years, and they were silent years. There were no prophets. right? But with the coming of Jesus and the institution of the new covenant, we do see there are prophets here in the early church. Most of the time, these prophets would practice forth-telling, which is simply delivering God's message to His people. Sometimes, they would practice foretelling, which is where they would predict future events and give God's perspective on it. What's Agabus doing here? He's foretelling, right? He's by the Holy Spirit, he's warning the church in Antioch that a great famine is coming during the reign of Claudius. And history does reveal there were a series of severe food shortages which hit the Mediterranean world during Claudius' reign, especially between ver- years 45 to 48 AD, which is not many years after this prophecy. Okay? So, how does the church in Antioch respond to prophecy? That was given to them by Agabus. Look at verse 29. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Here the church determines to give money to give relief to their fellow brothers and sisters in Judea. Do you think the church in Antioch and these Gentile believers had ever met the Christians, the bulk of Christians in Jerusalem? Probably not. 
But the early church, we saw selling their stuff, right, in order to make sure nobody was lacking. And we even saw Barnabas selling his land and giving the proceeds to the apostles. But here's a little different because this church in Antioch is taking up an offering for fellow Christians they don't know. They never met before. They are giving as they're able to proportionately to brothers and sisters who live far away from them. Here's my question to you this morning. Why, why on earth would they do that? Why would you sacrifice your own money for the sake of people you've never met before? What, what good reason would you have for that? Now, as you think about that question, let me remind you of something. Had the church in Jerusalem blessed the church in Antioch? What do you think? Uh, I Pastor, they didn't say anything about sending money to Antioch. They didn't send money. What did they send? They sent Barnabas. Right? They sent Bar- one of their best. They sent as a gift to that church in Antioch to help give them strength to help build them up in the faith. Believe me, do you think that they could have used Barnabas in Jerusalem? Oh, I'm sure they could have used Barnabas around. So this was a sacrifice from the church in Jerusalem. Say, here, take Barnabas. He's going to be a blessing to your body. And so just as Antioch received spiritual blessings from Jerusalem, now we see Jerusalem is going to receive physical blessings from the church in Antioch. These churches look different. I'm sure they sounded different. One's primarily Jewish, one's Gentile, but they had the same Savior. They had the same Holy Spirit. And so they had that same desire to love each other. That's a motive. But there's a greater motive still yet, and it's the Lord Jesus. It's the Gospel. Why would Antioch send money to Jerusalem? Well, the answer is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 where Paul is telling believers in Corinth, hey, set aside money for believers in Jerusalem. A different famine, all right? Set aside money for these believers. And Paul says, I'm not going to order you to do that. I'm not going to say I'm an apostle. I said so. You better listen to me. And so Paul says, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that even though he was rich, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, can become rich. Jesus gave up everything to come into this world and die on the cross for us in our sins. He became poor for us. And if you receive that gift of His grace, then then who are we to hoard our goods? Right? He made Himself poor so that we could become rich. So we should be generous to others. Take a look at verse 30. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul couple of notes here. Barnabas and Saul are the delivery boys from Antioch with the offering. Okay. But who do Barnabas and Saul give the money to? Who do they give the money to? The elders. This is interesting. Okay. There's a shift that's happened here in the leadership structure of the church where up until this point, it was the apostles who were the leaders of the church. And now, this is the first mention of the office of elder. Okay? And so it seems that the day-to-day leadership of the church was transferred from the apostles to the elders at this point. Especially as the apostles would go about on a, and on journeys and share the gospel. It is here that the elders are staying planted firmly in the church in Jerusalem and are leading. And so it's pretty cool to see all these things in one passage. Right? We see a church born, we see it grow, we see it learning, we see it advancing in the faith, and then we end it, they're actually blessing believers who were believers before they were, the church in Jerusalem. And we need to see that all that happened because these believers in Antioch were completely fixated on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were Christ-centered. They're preaching, they're believing, they're learning, they're giving. It all centered on what Jesus had done for them and the grace they received in Christ. And so as we look at ourselves and we look at our own church, the Scripture is a mirror that we hold up to ourselves and we ask the question, how do we look? Are we fixated and centered on the Lord Jesus Christ? Is everything that we're doing the result of our devotion and love for Jesus and what He's done to save us? Because that's got to drive everything we do. 
whether it's giving out candy to kids in the community, coming to pack shoe boxes, coming to Sunday school, men's group, serving one another in ways that need, when people need help, whatever it is, preaching, teaching, serving, it's got to be driven by the good news of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're in it for the wrong reason. And so we need to hold that mirror of the Scriptures up to us and say, why, why do we do what we're doing? Lord God, help us to have pure motives in everything we do and say. For Your glory, for Your honor in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You for Your Word, the Gospel, the truth that we sang about, that we pray about, that we preach about, Lord. I pray we would be completely fixated and centered on that message of salvation and forgiveness through the work of Jesus in His death, burial, and resurrection. And now even in His ascension as our High Priest, may we have that Gospel ministry driving what we do as a church that You would use us to spread that good news to others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.